I'm Molly Barnes. Welcome to our show. The first time I remember the art scene in New York being stolen away from Europe was with the abstract expressionist painters. That was really in the 50s. And artists were painting anything that did not resemble their dog, their house, anything that looked realistic at all. It was all about color and movement. Then there was a reaction against that, which was really, or the younger generation trying to create their own art, which became known as pop art. And the leaders of that period were Jasper Johns, Robert Rauschenberg, Jim Rosenquist, artists who were really painting the landscape, the industrial landscape. Out of that came a wonderful artist named Alan Wolfson. His work is actually called, uh, it's actually called Miniatures. And the work that he creates, as you can see, as we saw by the opening with his little Chinese restaurant, are absolute replicas of reality, and particularly a nostalgia from New York, the ideas that we all remember of New York 10 or 20 years ago. Welcome to my guest, Alan Wolfson. Thank you very much. <laughs> How are you, Alan? I'm fine, fine. I just think this work is extraordinary. You had a show at my gallery, I remember years ago, seeing a show at uh, Jackie Anhalt's gallery, yeah, and also in New York at uh, Louis Mizell and at the Museum of Miniatures here mm -hmm. in, in Los Angeles. How did you get started on this? Well, I think um, when I was a kid, I was always building things. You know, I, I would disappear into my room for hours and just build things. Out and where was, where was home? I grew up in Brooklyn, in New York. Now, was that a tough neighborhood? <laughs> yeah, the neighborhood I grew up in was, was, was pretty bad. Does Brooklyn <laughs> look right across at Manhattan? And not, not, not where I live. Where were you? <laughs> in Bedford-Stuyvesant, mainly. And it was very, was it a scary area? Well, when I was really young, it was actually uh, uh, a pretty, it wasn't that bad. I mean, when I was really young, it was pretty much a middle class neighborhood. But as, as I became a teenager and such, the neighborhoods in the outer boroughs really started declining. Were your and family involved with <coughs> art at all? My father was an artist, yeah. He, uh, he worked as a letterer and a commercial artist and a sign painter. Do you think that coming from that kind of environment helps you to become an artist? Oh, absolutely. I, um, a lot of the things I work on now, I can actually, you know, somewhere in the back of my head, I'll be doing something in the studio, and somewhere in the back of my head, I remember something he taught me, you know, when I was a kid. Um, and I, I draw on all that stuff. Do you remember the first minute you decided to become an artist? Do you I never that actually, awareness? Did, I never actually had uh, conscious awareness of that because this was something, like I said, I always did. I was, I always had a project going, and it never occurred to me that this could be my life's work, and uh, you know, I could earn a living doing this. Um, and it was just something I actually did in my spare time until I got offered a show, totally out of the blue in L.A. in 19, 1980, and then through that show I got uh, offered a show in New York. Were you supporting yourself as doing something else? Or um, how, how were for you? the most part I was doing uh, miniature effects for movies, architectural models. Over the years I've done, uh, I worked for Disney for a couple of years doing um, uh, d design models of their theme park uh, for theme park development. There are a number of artists that you think of who go through periods of doing miniatures, such as Roland Reese, who is the chairman mm -hmm. of the art department at Claremont. Michael uh, McMillan. Michael McMillan. Mm -hmm. Ma Monty Chiare, who is an mm -hmm. Italian artist who shows with O.K. Harris. Mm -hmm. Bob Graham went through a long period of doing miniatures, right. where he was actually stealing his wife's clothes and cutting them up to make little <laughs> underwear for his little dolls. Uh -huh. uh, do, you, do you see yourself as lasting in this field or as moving on to another area of expression? Well, I've always wanted to do large size walk-in environments. I mean, some of my background actually is in scenic design, and I've always wanted to be able to do so. Well, well Michael McMillan has, has done a whole series of uh, work that you can actually walk through. He well, does, he has he the does permanent ex there's uh, one of his pieces at the Los Angeles County Art right, Museum, garage, which is right. a permanent display, and <coughs> mm -hmm. it's a garage, his grandfather's garage. Right. It's everybody's grandfather's mm -hmm. garage. It's my grandfather's mm -hmm. garage, too. Well, also, uh, Keenholz, I, I really love his work, and I, I love the fact that, um, like Barney's Beanery, that piece, you could actually walk through that environment, and that's something I'd, l I'd love to do. Well, why don't we look at one of your pieces, and okay. you can tell us how you set it up and how you do it. Okay. Okay. Tell us about this. Now that's um, Rialto Cinema, which uh, I did in 1999. And um, my main process actually is m most of my environments are not existing locations. They might be based on existing locations, but most of them are environments that e I either totally make up 
or I pulled details from existing environments. And this is actually one that I pulled different details um, to come up with, with, with this now, design. Now, because we have nothing to put it against, how big is that? Um, I believe the measurements were about 12 inches wide by roughly 9 or 10 inches high. Most of them are half inch to foot scale. If, the, if that gives you an idea, a uh, dollhouse scale is inch to foot. So this is approximately, this, this is half of dollhouse scale. Okay, now I see a little poster for Clockwork Orange. How mm -hmm. did you, where did you find that? Uh, actually, I, well, for the past couple of years I've been doing most of my graphics in the computer in Photoshop. Um, but before that, the earlier pieces, it's, they were all hand done with transfer type and uh, you know reduced uh, reduced pictures that I found in magazines and such. But all of the architectural work is done with plastic. Yeah, everything is completely fabricated from scratch. I don't buy anything. Everything is what what you're looking at in any one of my pieces is probably I don't know uh, fifty thousand little pieces of plastic all glued together. And to to give you an idea, if I do a brick wall, each brick is cut. It's a strip of plastic cut to size, painted, then glued on one at a time. And that's the only way I feel. I, I've experimented with uh, several different techniques to make the process go faster, but the, the only way I can really achieve the look of realism I'm going for is to do it like that. How long does it take you to do a box like the one we just saw? Uh, the, one, the one you saw was about two months. Uh, the largest piece I ever did, which was a Las Vegas casino, that took about nine months. And a, a typical major piece takes anywhere from, I would have to say, four to seven months. That would be a, a typical major Alan, piece. Alan, I've, I've come to your house. It is so suburban, so uh, <laughs> safe. Uh, it's so totally different than what you're doing. Do you mm -hmm. find a release in working in a very quiet environment? I do. When I lived in New York, there was just too much going on around me. Um, when, when I take on a, a project, the, these to me are major projects. It's a total commitment. And I just have to realize that if I'm doing something that, well, first of all, I've never been able to estimate exactly how long a piece is going to take. If you were commissioning a piece and you said, well, well, when can I have it? I can tell you, okay, in three months you'll have it, but more than likely in six months you might have it. Um, what, I, what I try to do is actually sequester myself. I lock myself in the studio as much as I can. How and can that, you be married and do that? Um, understanding wife. <laughs> <laughs> she knows what you're going through. Well, she's in a lot of ways she's the same way. I mean, she's very she's very committed to what she does. She's a visual effects supervisor for movies, and that takes a lot of time out of her life. And she's uh, and uh, she started out as a performance artist, so. Um, so she understands the, excuse the expression, obsession. Yeah, yeah, and she's obsessed in her own ways. So. <laughs> okay, here we're looking at another one. In fact, this is one I'm buying. Yes. Tell me about this. Uh, subway entrance. Uh, again, it's not based on a specific location. It's more of, a, in a way, a generic subway entrance. Then there's a view that goes down the flight of stairs where you can actually see uh, partway down the... Uh, uh, the pedestrian walkway. Do you light? Do you design your own lights? Oh yeah, all the lighting is done from scratch. I use a combination. There, of, see, uh, we're going down. Yeah. Now this looks just like that subway station on Lafayette and Spring Street in Manhattan, mm -hmm. and you always run into people coming home from art openings, uh -huh. going into that. It's right. almost like it, it's uh, just for the art crowd of that subway. Uh -huh. So you do the lighting. Right. The lighting, um, I like to experiment with different types of lighting. I mean, in that particular piece, it's all incandescent. But uh, a piece we'll see later, which is a diner piece, I actually use the combination of um, incandescent, fluorescent, and LEDs. And I like to experiment with different things. Now, those little them. pieces of Deuterus, the little pieces of trash on the sidewalk, how do you create those? Uh, little pieces of paper. <laughs> and then do you, do you put a resin on them or something to yeah, finish them? Yeah, uh, a lot of times they're dipped in white, white glue, and they just, you know, and I, I actually shape them so that they look to scale. Peter Frank gave you a great review in uh, oh, good. <laughs> uh, LA Weekly, and this is one of the ones he spe specifically liked. Where is this? This doesn't exist anywhere, actually. This is a place I made up. I was doing a show at a gallery in Miami, and I want, I, <coughs> excuse me, I wanted at least one piece that was more reflective of, you know, since most of my work is about New York, I wanted at least one piece that was more of a, say, I don't know, local appeal. So this is uh, sort of, uh, you know, what I view as sort of a generic roadside Floridian cheap motel. <laughs> are there different colors that are predominant in different parts of the country? Oh, absolutely. What are they? Well, for example, um, 
in that particular piece, which had sort of a deco flavor to it, I was going for more the Caribbean, I, I guess you'd call them the Caribbean pinks and blues, which I think are real prominent. Sort of Versace colors. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then the view into the room on that piece, um, well, let me, let me say at this point, I never put people in the pieces. But what I'm trying to do is create a narrative by what people leave behind. So, for example, in that piece, you're looking through the partially open door and you can see the bed with clothes laying on it and there's a phone off the hook and there's a bottle of liquor there. What happened? Well, that's, that's, for, that's for you to tell me. Well, it sounds like a lot of my life. What, what happened in there? I knew you looked familiar. That's yeah, a lot right. of my life. Too. Was there a murder in there or something? No, I, 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 would, I think the most um, common interpretation of that piece would be that somebody had a liaison there maybe? Or, Possibly. Uh, yeah, somebody, somebody was partying there. What are the colors in New York and L.A.? Uh, well, L.A., the pieces I've done about L.A., I, I try to incorporate more, um, I don't know, sort of traditional, perhaps Mexican colors. I mean, in terms of graffiti and stuff, I would give them a, a different color than, say, the graffiti I would put on a piece that was reflective of New York. I mean, New York, I think, is more black. I mean, everybody dresses in black. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, um, it's funny, you know, in different countries we used to think of different colors having importance, but now that the Internet has made a global world mm -hmm. so different, people have different interpretations of color, but it's all sort of changing and it's coming together. And I think artists are really reinforcing that or showing us that, particularly mm -hmm. pattern and design artists. I see that over and over again. Mm -hmm. The colors. Well, who was it? Diana Vreeland said that uh, shocking pink is the navy blue of India, and I thought that was great. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> what about this one? Okay, this is Miss America Diner. This is a piece I did this past year, and this is. Uh, is this a real diner somewhere? This is based on actual location, which is in Jersey City. Actually, uh, before I moved back to the West Coast, I photographed this. And I always wanted to do a piece on it because it's, it's just a classic diner. It's a beautiful diner. But I only do a diner piece. Um, I think I've done three or four of them. I only do probably one every seven to ten years because they are the hardest ones I do because every single aspect of the piece is an individual design project. Now, how do you do that? Oh, uh, that's a backlighted uh, plastic box, and the lettering is transfer type. That's amazing. <laughs> Do you have the food and everything inside? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think there's even a shot of that coming up, perhaps, where a view into the window, you can see a half-eaten uh, half meal and a tip on the table. And uh, also on the roof of that diner, the, if you noticed in the overall shot, there was a ladder going up to the I roof. I saw that. There's, uh, they're overhauling the air conditioning system up there where the, uh, the vent is, is open and the motor is pulled out and there's a brand new motor sitting in a box. Now oh. this looks like the entrance to the diner across from the Javits Center on 10th and mm -hmm. 38th. No, Jersey City. But. Okay, now how do you get that high, uh, that silver? Oh, uh, it's behind? paint. Yeah, it's just... Uh, is it dangerous? Uh, the paint? Yeah. Yeah, if you breathe it. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you breathe it, <laughs> not if you look at it. <laughs> Did you spend time there, or did you just? Uh, I photographed it, and then I thought about it for a long time. It's a piece I was I was really anxious to do, but I was just. Did I'm you ever know John Bader's uh, paintings of oh, diners? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I yeah, you're probably pals. Now uh -huh. tell me about this. Oh, uh, this is a view into the window that shows the half eaten. What I was talking about before, the half eaten uh, meal with a tip on the table, and uh, and there's um, I believe there's an ashtray with. Uh, stumped out uh, cigarette butts. Who was this? Who was in there? Um, in your imagination? Well, uh, it, it could have been somebody in the neighborhood that came in for lunch, or could, it could have been somebody that sat there reading the paper for two There's hours. There's nothing sinister. With Roland Reese's boxes, there was quite often a sinister feeling. Mm -hmm. The place was about to explode, mm -hmm. or there'd been a murder mystery, and you had to uncover it through. This is, this is much more left up to us to find out. Yeah, I try to give you enough information that you can formulate your own scenario. Um, you know, some of the things are quite straightforward. I mean, but I think I, I think I, I leave enough props around yeah. that I, I think different people come up with different scenarios. Have you ever made jewelry? No. Bruce uh, Houston, who you know quite well, uh -huh. always makes a little piece of something out of everything. Well, actually, uh, actually, I take that back because the last piece, the diner piece, where the ladder was going up to the roof, there were uh, orange 
cones there, yeah, yeah, the, the yeah, danger right. cones. I made my wife a pair of earrings, but you know, out of those, I had castings left. Oh, so, fantastic. so she has a couple of uh, road hazard cones that she wears. Uh, this is a larger piece. It's one of the. It's a. Ser it's from a series of wall hangings I did, which were basically just sections of subway environments. And, th and this was sort of a compromise between my miniatures and what I was talking about before, where I'd like to do walk-through environments. So this piece is uh, obviously bigger than any of my miniatures. It's uh, approximately four feet across. When you go to New York now, do you see a difference between New York then when you were reporting and today? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, since Giuliani's been there, he's actually cleaned it up. Um, I miss a lot of the graffiti. I do, too. Yeah. I miss it. A lot uh -huh. of people don't love graffiti, but uh -huh. I think it tells a lot about our culture and a lot about that particular environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's something very sterile, sterile about the way it is now. I mean, uh, it is a safer city, I think. When I left... Uh, when I left to move back to California in 1990, it had actually become a pretty dangerous place, I, I think. It seems that New York makes artists the stars. In Los Angeles, it's always the movie people, but artists are truly the stars. And I think you see examples of art everywhere. There's mm -hmm. sculpture, there's outdoor sculpture, there are billboards that are, are actually set up by mm -hmm. artists to promote right. art. You know, when I was there the last time, there was a series of uh, cows sculptural cows all over the city. I think, uh, I forgot how many, 100 or 500, I don't know. But well, they gave those to artists to design, and I understand that David Lynch was the only person whose art cow was rejected really? because he had forks <laughs> <laughs> sticking into the cow. Uh -huh. It's amazing. I don't know who came up with it, but every block you walk on, there's right. a cow now uh -huh. with some sort of political statement. Uh -huh. I've always thought that artists uh, who have some sort of a childhood illness or are forced into isolation because mm -hmm. of a disease or some childhood mm -hmm. injury come out with more of an understanding of art. Did something well, that like actually that happen to you? Yeah, that actually happened later in life to me. When I was in the service, I ended up spending all, uh, approximately a year in the hospital, in and out of hospitals. and. Some of my original ideas, well, like I said, when I was a kid, I was always building things, and uh, I also said that you know I never thought that this would turn into my life's work. But laying around the hospital, in a way, it was... How long were you there? Well, almost a year. I was in the military at the time, and I spent almost a year in and out of hospitals. I spent a lot of time just laying there, just thinking of different environments. A lot of it was... Uh, well, some of it was being homesick. I mean, there were a lot of New York environments I thought about. But I also thought about, you know, building some of these things in miniature, and that's where I came up with a lot of my original, some of my original ideas, which years later, when I started doing my work, those were some of the first pieces I did. Well, how could you do that? How could you think about something and then record it if you couldn't write it down? Um, unfortunately, I had a lot of time to to, to just do that. really plan. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and there's a yearning for New York that's very yeah. There, very, there, there, very there was a you know there was a component of that of being homesick. I think. Alan, why don't you talk about this piece that you brought okay. today? This is uh, we've taken the glass box off. So uh -huh. could... yeah, there's usually a clear plexiglass cover. This is based on actual location in New York's Chinatown. The name of this piece is Ma's Home Cooking, and my understanding was that this uh, this is a restaurant that didn't used to look like this. Apparently they were shooting a movie on this street. It's a very historic street in uh, Chinatown. And they were shooting a movie there and the set dressers came in and actually created that front. And the own, this is the way I heard the story, the owner of the restaurant liked the way it looked so much he convinced them to leave it up when they struck the set. So, um, yeah, this is based on that location. Now, it, it's, uh, it's pretty much the way the location is, but I did have to change certain things uh, just in terms of, you know, fitting it into a box. And, it looks and exactly <laughs> like Chinatown. It's the strangest <laughs> thing. And there's a view into the restaurant. I mean, some of the things you probably wouldn't be able to see on television is, you know, the view into the restaurant. There's chopsticks on the table in the back. There's uh, takeout orders waiting to be taken out. Uh, down the flight of steps, uh, the barber shop, you can see into the barber shop. Um, Next door, there's a flight of stairs. You can see partially up the flight of stairs. What's going on up there? Well, nothing really. <laughs> but you can only see enough that you wonder what is going on beyond that. And a, a, lo a lot of things I like to do in these pieces, and especially in the major pieces, I really, uh, I really have an opportunity to work this out because I have so much more of, a, I, I guess you'd call it a canvas to work on, is the fact 
around nooks and crannies. I mean, you know, actually, you can just give somebody a partial view around a corner, and hopefully, if it's, you know, hopefully, if it's done right, that'll that'll start their imagination. It's like what's going on around that corner, and even if I don't show them, there are hopefully are enough props and enough information there that it takes over. So it's not. So it doesn't come across as a static piece of artwork. I never put people in the pieces because uh, um, I, I'm just trying to give you enough information by what they leave behind, whether it's the garbage, the graffiti, the half-eaten meals. Uh, hopefully I'm giving you enough of that information that it feels like there are people there or it feels like people just left. I always worry about Nam June Pike. What happens when he dies? How do you replace the lights? How do you replace the uh, Well, these the are all things? these all come do apart from the back, if I turn this around perhaps okay okay and the backs lift off of these pieces oh, might all the different sections come out and there's instructions in there and wow. there, are, there are spare bulbs and I try to make them as user-friendly as possible. But most of these bulbs um, hardly ever blow out. I mean, the little incandescent ones are rated at like 20,000 hours or something, so unless somebody just leaves it on for eternity. I mean, but, but occasionally, you know, somebody might have to change a bulb or something. But I try to make them as user-friendly as possible. And, uh, and in case I ever do have to do any sort of repair work or anything, it's like I don't have to destroy the piece to do it. I mean, it's all modular. Amazing. So, you know, it's quite a bit of engineering that goes into these also. I mean, before I actually sit down to start working on the actual piece, I usually end up building a mock-up out of cardboard just to make sure everything's going to fit and there's enough room for the wiring, for the lighting, and um, that's kind of how well, I work Well, let's turn it back around. Okay. <laughs> Alan, who are some of your favorite artists? Well, Keen Holtz. Um, Did you know him? No. No, but he I... He was a man who really thought in black and white. He always had some sort of bone of contention, something to pick a fight about, but he was a brilliant guy. Uh-huh. Um, I love his work. I mean, I've just always admired it tremendously. Uh, I've also, um, a lot of the photorealists. Who? Richard Estes. Why? Um, well, our subject matter is so similar. I mean, especially his early work is so much about New York and urban environments, and I just love, I, I just love his environments. And uh, everything 17 inches was in focus, and then everything was out of focus. Uh -huh. it was, and, and the reflection of the glass it was extraordinary. Yeah. I actually, in my gallery, discovered some of those, uh, the photorealists Bob Cottingham, Don Eddy, uh -huh. Bill Warehall. I loved that kind of I mean, right. it, it was so easy to understand. Mm -hmm. Well, technically, I think it's amazing. I've always been drawn towards realism. And the first time I ever saw a show of photorealist paintings, I just, um, I was just, I was into it. Ralph <laughs> I mean, Goins. Oh yeah, absolutely. Ralph Goins, uh, Davis Cohn, who does movie, he does movie theaters, and you mentioned before John Bader, who does diners, and um, I, I love the technical aspect of it. I love the fact that uh, they're putting realism on canvas. I mean. One of the things about pop art is it's easy to understand without an art background. I think that was why it was taken so quickly by the public. Mm -hmm. But often the elitist art world feels that it has to be difficult to understand in order to be valuable or important. How do you feel about that? Um, I, don't, I don't know if I agree with that. I mean, it's what you get out of it when you look at it. I mean, not everybody's going to get the same thing out of it. I mean, something, something that appears to be, you know, quote, black and white could mean something vastly different to somebody else. I mean, two people looking at this piece that, that we just showed might get a whole different narrative scenario out of it. And I, I think that's great. I mean... Who do you play for? Who do I play for? Who do you play for? Who do you design for? Who do you make these for in your um, head? I have my own, my own vision that I'm trying to put there. And uh, ultimately, I have my own standards that Whose I have Whose approval to would you most like to have? Probably my own. I mean, oh, I'm that's not, amazing. I'm not, Usually, when I ask an artist, "Who do you like as an artist? Who do you respect? Who mm -hmm. do you want to see your work?" They almost invariably say Jasper Johns. Is that right? And I think because it's difficult to understand, but mm -hmm. also there are puzzles, there are riddles, mm -hmm. and they can be interpreted, and eventually you find a meaning. There are layers. Well, of I find myself um, when I'm 
when I'm getting close to be finished with a project, I mean, very often friends will come over and, and look at the project and, and just say, well, it's done. And I'm going, no, it's not done because, you know, something is missing for me. I mean, so I have to, I have to get it to that point that I feel most comfortable with it and I feel I'm getting what I envision across. Picasso said once, a woman asked him, how do you know when you finished a painting? And he said, how do you know when you finished making love? <laughs> Same well, thing. Well. <laughs> Alan, my last question. Uh, what uh, do you see yourself doing in the next five years, five years from now? Uh, I, well, I'm hoping to do, most of my work has been about New York, some of it about LA, a little bit about Las Vegas. Um, I'm hoping to do some series of other places, actually. I'm going to Japan next week. I'm going to take a bunch of pictures, and hopefully I can get enough information and enough feel for the culture that I, I can do it justice. And uh, uh, I've been doing more and more pieces about Los Angeles, and I'd also like the opportunity to do some walk-through environments. I mean, that's something I definitely have planned. Is God dead? Is God dead? Was, you he ever, see, was he ever alive? <laughs> Do you see a correlation between art and God? No, I, I think um, I think people people need what they need to get through their situations, and if it's God or if it's art or if it's wearing a red blouse, I mean, this is what people people take what they need. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Alan. I've really enjoyed seeing you. I think your art is amazing. Thank you very I just much. love it, and I look forward to having one in my home. Art is not for everyone, it never has been, it never will be, but for those of you who love it like we do, we want to turn you on. I'm Molly Barnes. <laughs>